It was one of the darkest moments in our history. Ron not only lost the copyrights of Dianetics, but even the use of his own name. Ron fought back quick and hard. He retrieved his taped lectures and materials and slapped Purcell with a criminal suit. He then set off on his own, pushing ahead with research that no one had their hands on. Scientology. And when he finally moved to Phoenix, Arizona to open the first Scientology organization, the Wichita students and pre-clears left Purcell in droves. Advancing the tech and expanding Scientology was Ron's ultimate handling to any attack. For only if the tech was widely available, would it be safe from seizure. Thus, in Phoenix, he completed no less than 18 books, including self-analysis, Scientology 880 and 88008, Creation of Human Ability, and Dianetics 55. Within a matter of months after his arrival in Phoenix, Ron's lectures were drawing hundreds of students from around the world. He also issued the first Scientology Auditor Bulletins. Armed with this new technology, Scientologists who had been trained by Ron returned to their hometowns to establish dozens of auditing groups, from Seattle to London and Los Angeles to Melbourne. And finally, even the war with Purcell was won. All rights to Dianetics reverted to Ron, and the SP oil man was never to be heard of again. In the spring of 1955, beginning a new phase of worldwide expansion for Scientology, Ron moved his headquarters to the nation's capital, where he established the founding church in Washington, D.C. To handle long-distance comm lines, he established the first Hubbard Communications Office. To strengthen Scientology activities in the field and build orgs, he discovered and released many breakthroughs on the subject of organization. It was also in Washington that Ron established the first Scientology center to handle the printing and distribution of LRH books and materials. This center made the tech broadly available to Scientologists for the first time and set Scientology on the road to becoming a global organization. And with the flood of new books and materials, Scientology groups and churches began expanding like never before into Canada, Australia, South Africa, and even as far afield as Israel and Egypt. But not everyone was happy. Alarmed by Scientology's growth and prodded on by their psychiatric allies, enemy-controlled agencies launched a new round of covert operations. According to FBI records, at least three undercover operatives were sent into the founding church. Mail was opened, auditing sessions were bugged, money was stolen, and that was just the beginning. Frustrated in their attempts to turn up any wrongdoing and growing ever more desperate to stop Ron in Scientology, enemy agents next sought to manufacture evidence. Using the local police captain's pregnant daughter as an operative, a preposterous plan was hatched to attend one of Ron's Congress lectures and entrap a staff member into arranging an illegal abortion. And finally, when that plot failed, government agents even tried to prove that the church use of vitamins constituted drug dealing. Infuriated by the total failure of these covert ploys, Ron's opponents next resorted to brute force. The Food and Drug Administration staged an all-out raid on the Washington church, sending in a team of longshoremen armed with guns to seize all e-meters and Scientology books. But church materials were all they got. Knowing their real motive was the complete destruction of Scientology through an attack on its headquarters, Ron had already set up new headquarters at St. Hill Manor in England. And so, while his enemies exhausted themselves in Washington, Ron began delivering a new special briefing course. He called in auditors from around the world and personally trained them on the latest technical developments. This became known as the St. Hill Special Briefing Course. As word of these developments spread, Scientologists from around the world flooded the St. Hill. And when they arrived, they found Ron had mapped out the exact training and auditing routes of Scientology, including the states of release and auditor class levels. 
These were then presented on the first classification and gradation chart. We have a, the idea of a bridge across the chasm. Now that is an old mystic idea that there was a chasm. There was a chasm between this existence, where we are now, and a higher plateau of existence. And that many people trying to make it fell into the abyss. Well, we've built a bridge, and we have this uh, simile of the bridge, and the bridge goes from this state of existence to that state of existence, and the bridge is all complete now, and it can be walked. But there's one point, you have to walk on the bridge. You know, you wouldn't think you'd have to tell people this. <laughs> you'd say to somebody, you can cross the Grand Canyon as long as you walk across the bridge. And you think that is enough, but by George, somebody will go down to the edge and walk off into thin air. And you say, <laughs> <laughs> In addition to the grade chart and the technical breakthroughs at St. Hill, Ron continued his work to build orgs around the world. He developed a wealth of new administrative technology, which today can be found in the OEC volumes. And finally, Ron discovered how to erase the black core of the reactive mind. This was the clearing course, the carefully laid path which made it possible for the first time for anyone to reach the state of clear. With the clearing course complete, and his sights now on levels beyond clear, Ron began making plans to establish a new research base. After carefully considering several possibilities, he finally decided to go to Rhodesia in southern Africa. As well as seeking out a research base, Ron wanted to see what an OT could accomplish alone. And to begin with, he accomplished a lot even appearing on national TV and befriending major political leaders. Well, I met all the ministers and talked to them, had sundowners with them, and met the prime minister and all that, and uh, had tea with his wife and, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I was a very acceptable bloke, I assure you. Very acceptable. I didn't say one single word about Scientology. And every time anybody would ask me about Scientology, well, I would just brush it off and not say anything about it. I'd define the word for them or something like that, and then go on talking about cows or gold mines or something like that. <laughs> well, I probably was giving them a whole dose of no auditing in actual fact. <laughs> but uh, I was purposely and with malice aforethought examining the log world. And I didn't want to unwog anybody. <laughs> Although he found much of the country to his liking, there was one factor which he could not tolerate. Racism. What he proposed to eliminate that injustice was at least 20 years ahead of its time. An entirely new constitution presented to the prime minister calling for full participation of blacks in the government. Although immediately gaining support with both straight into the teeth of two suppressive forces, white supremacists and their allies within British intelligence. Concluding that Ron's proposal offered too much freedom, this secret arm of the Rhodesian government had him exiled. And so, while his native friends literally wept, he packed his bags for England. Although deeply saddened that he could not do more for Rhodesia, his arrival back in England was joyful. Greeted by hundreds of Scientologists, he was even afforded a motorcade back to his home at St. Hill. With his return to England, Ron continued his exploration of the levels beyond Clear. In particular, he was now attempting to forge his way through OT3, the Wall of Fire. And as he moved deeper into that startling realm, two vital facts became apparent. First, he knew that man's freedom would only be possible once the OT levels had been fully mapped. And second, 
He knew that only an organization of dedicated OTs could put ethics in on the planet and safeguard the upper levels of the Scientology bridge.